I didn't introduce myself, but my name is Damien with my blueprint. Instead of kind of reading off some pre-written bio for Glenn, I'm going to let him introduce himself and, and really take it away from here. So Glenn, I know everyone who's here is excited to hear from you. Let's, let's get into it. Excellent. Well, well, thanks, Damien. Glad to be part of the, the My Blueprint adventure and webinar, <laughs> webinar world. Just so you know, there's nothing psychedelic behind me other than it's a neuro artist who, and it's an etching of a sliver of the hippocampus, which is one of the uh, memory centers uh, of our brain. I, I always like to use it as my background. So I wanted to share that with you. Uh, a little bit about me. Appreciate the ability to introduce myself. I, I, I'm currently a history teacher and I, I never want uh, to forget that. I, I teach 10th grade history in the U.S. It's a, it's a transnational history class. I'm at a school that's just outside of Washington, D.C., St. Andrews Episcopal School, where I've been a, an advisor to middle school students and high school students in my just short of 30-year history uh, career as a teacher. I've been a women's soccer coach for many of those years, but my big job and how it relates to tonight or today, if you're watching it at a different time or a different part of the world, is that I direct the Center for Transformative Teaching and Learning. And it's, the CTTL is the only educational neuroscience research center based in the US and by teachers that has this international public purpose. And that is to serve teachers and schools and districts around the world by bringing them the most promising research and strategies and how the brain learns. I, I co-authored a book uh, with Dr. Ian Keller, our head of research. And as Damien referenced, we have a, a product called NeuroTeach Global that using an innovative delivery method, we can bring you the science of teaching and learning through the NeuroTeach Global platform. More of that to come. 10 of you are going to get copies of it, so I'm pretty psyched uh, about that. So a little bit about today, if, you, if we could do this in person on our campus, this is the CTTL. And I do hope, and please know this is an open invitation, you get to the DC area, pop in. We love friends. More importantly, I look forward to learning from the teachers in, in the audience. The center really is in this, a, a unique spot between the academic research that goes on at universities in Canada, the US, around the world, and classroom practices. We, are, we, we see ourselves as this bridge between the research and the researchers and getting it into the heads and hearts and everyday work of teachers with all their students. And it's an exciting place to be. And it comes with these great opportunities to share. And I love that My Blueprint has created this opportunity for us. I've learned one thing about distance learning. We know from research that reading from slides is not uh, really good for the, the learner's brain. So I'll stop for a second. And here's what we're gonna try to accomplish in about 45 minutes with Q&A and hopefully some laughter and some fun. This is pretty, this is an ambitious agenda, but I'm not afraid of it. We're gonna explore, examine, consider, and leave with some next day strategies. And really, I wanna emphasize new friends. I love connections and I wanna be part of wherever you might be on your journey as a professional on thinking about what science and research can do, not only for my professional growth as an educator, but for the students I work with every single day. So uh, before we get further along, I would love to know who's in the audience. I see there's about 37 people live. That probably includes me. But if we can launch the first poll, uh, just to get a sense of where, you know, what, what roles you play um, at your school, in your district, in your province, or in your program. So love to just see who's in the audience, because it's always good to know who my new friends are. So I see we got, you know, largely high school, we got middle school. Love that we have elementary and primary mm -hmm. in this space. The work you guys do in the elementary and the early years, it makes my work as a high school teacher so much easier. And you get the brain when it's most plastic and, and one of the most sensitive periods other than puberty. The others, if you could put in the chat what you do, that'd be, I'd be interested to know how, what work you're doing in your school program, in your province or your district. Just certainly love to hear who, what that is. So. A uh, little low-tech moment, you can decide, so as a teacher, I want you to leave with something, right? I mean, you know, I've been to many professional learning experiences like you guys in the audience, uh, and I really want takeaways. So if you have a piece of paper, which to be honest is a big ass when you do a webinar, you might want to do just a low resolution of our, of our internationally famous, but not yet copyrighted, because I don't think we can, our keep, tweak, stop, and start uh, chart. Because as we advance through the little chunks that I'm going to give you on the science of learning, I'm going to ask you to pause to say, what might you keep doing as a teacher, school leader, 
program leader, tweak, stop, or start. You could take a picture of it, you know, just do a little screenshot um, and type. I will say this, handwriting your ideas does help put it into long-term memory in ways that certainly keyboarding doesn't. So I throw that out there as uh, you decide, you're the learner, you decide what you want to do. So how did I get into this space of being in this privileged space of being able to present to you uh, today? And I'll just say it started out in 2007 with this generative question. And I would argue that if you haven't yet, you should ask this question at your school or in your district when you can during, during some time this year. And why this question is so important is because we know from research, uh, and this is a, a great paper that came out in May of 2020 from Johns Hopkins and, and David Steiner and his team. The strongest education research finding in the last 20 years is that the quality of a teacher is the single greatest in school determinant of student outcomes. We must continue investing in the human teacher. And certainly we all feel like first year teachers in many ways this year, I certainly do. Um, I've been in distance teaching, I'm, I'm transitioning to hybrid teaching. I'll tell you, my, my learning curve has been high. But we know humans can do something that technology can never do. And we know from the science of how the brain learns, we have to honor that and emphasize that. Another paper that you might be interested in, all these will be available to you. The Aspen Institute in the US has a really great research base. And I love how they talk about how teachers should know the science of human development and learning. In the United States, it's certainly not a prerequisite to be in front of class in the classroom. Well, the problem is there's this great irony in education. And here's the irony. You know, we have surveyed thousands of teachers around the world. And roughly 20% of teachers and school leaders have foundational understanding in the science of learning. Now that seems like it could be one of the great ironies in education. Because if there's one educational truth that I don't think anybody in the audience can push back on, and certainly gently push back if you want in the chat, but is that every day, every one of your students, you know, across Canada, the US, Europe, the, the rest of the world, will have their brain with them when they go to school. And I would argue then, if that's the case, then shouldn't all teachers have some foundational and accurate knowledge of the science behind learning? And that's what the work of the center does and, and you know, our NeuroTeach global platform does and, and our book NeuroTeach does. And I hope we can be part of your journey in any way. So let me just set the, set the table quickly and I will pause to see if anything has emerged in the chat, if Siobhan and Damien have seen anything. What the field we're talking about is mind, brain and education science research. We were introduced to this field by Harvard professor, Dr. Kurt Fisher over, over a decade ago and Dr. Christina Hinton. And it's this transdisciplinary field that needs to work both ways, where research in cognitive science, psychology, educational research, and neuroscience are, are, being, are informing classrooms. And what teachers do is we get to see if it works in our context with our kids, and we report it back to the research. The field is broad. You know, look at, this, look at this, these lists. There's something here for everybody, whether you're teaching the youngest learners throughout Canada or wherever you are in the world, or the oldest learners. Imagine if all teachers knew this research. And I would argue to you, it's, it's accessible. Because in our, our teacher-led organization, we really think about how to make this stuff teacher-friendly. So I'm going to, I think I'm going to pause for a second here. Are there any questions, Damien and Siobhan, that I just don't want to overlook early on? Yeah, it was a, a great question, Sarah, just, just wrote in the chat. So obviously, you know, we talked about the importance of teachers to understand some brain science, but what about, what, what are your thoughts, Glenn, on sharing information about brain science explicitly with students? So, that question should have been the plant. I love that. Sarah, thank you. So it's interesting. The work we started to do a decade ago with our faculty uh, at St. Andrews, so we train 100% of our teachers here in educational neuroscience. We, we said, okay, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna train 100% of the teachers and the chief beneficiaries will be the students. And we've sustained that training all throughout that time. I think you make, though, uh, a really good argument, and we are about to shift to we are starting to elevate our work of bringing the research more directly to students. We're about to start building something called NeuroTeach Global Student to really disrupt the traditional study skills approach that we've often done to bring strategies to kids. So Sarah, I'd love to talk to you more about it. 
maybe you can even you know, be part of our, our thinking team if you're interested. So you know, shoot an email secretly to one of us or just follow us on Twitter, consider us friends. And here's why, and here's why I would suggest it's an exciting time to be a teacher. Though I gotta tell you, I'm tired already. And I think you guys probably are too. It, it is hard to teach if you're teaching distance or hybrid or you're constrained on your, your campuses. Certainly the United States situation is a little different than Canada's. So maybe, maybe, I, maybe I need to go to Canada, but you don't let me in across the border. So I don't have the option. But look at these two uh, pieces of art. The one sort of statue is how we used to think about the brain. And then we had a student, Joy Reeves, who's now at Duke University. She started interviewing our teachers to draw her interpretation of the brain. So I'm gonna pause for a second. If you can put in the chat, which part of the brain that Joy has, has drawn, do you find it sort of catches your attention? Because in many ways, it's a very accurate depiction of the adult brain or of, of her teachers when she was here. So love to love, throw it in the chat. I think I can look at the chat as well. What part of the, the, the educator's brain caught your attention the most? I see things popping in. Might be too late in the day for coffee. So, uh, Tania, if I said your name right, I'm with you. But coffee after 6 p.m., I'm not, at least on the East Coast. Greg, I love your point, right? Student, we're try, kids who are trying to find success in different environments. Fantastic. And if you, again, I could certainly share this image with you. It's a great discussion uh, piece, but we know so much more about the science behind how not only a student brain learns, but the adult brain learns. And what if your schools or districts, or even you as a teacher, started leveraging that science more? Certainly we have solutions or pathways or we'll, we'll share other options as well. I mean, we, we want to just be part of your journey. Uh, and the way we think about it is, imagine as this mind brain education science is the canopy or the lens to the umbrella to all your school's initiatives. You know, so not surprisingly, I made a little bigger for this session. We've been thinking hard about technology and our daily schedule and our distance learning program here through the lens of how the student brain learns, works, changes, and thrives. And I'll just pose a very rhetorical question. Is your school doing that yet? So whether we're in person, which is the environment we all love, right? Here's Christine Lewis, or here I am with Zane, or I love this picture of one of our students, distance learning, still raising her hand. You know, well done, right? Can't claim her as my student, but you know, regardless if we're in person, hybrid, or distance, the organ of learning will be with all our students. I think we should all work on how do we scale up our accurate knowledge of the organ of learning. So I'm gonna give you some insight into this work. This is a participatory moment. In the chat, if I asked you one thing, teachers, leaders out in this audience, that all of us should know about the learning brain, what might your answer be tonight or today? So be brave, throw an answer in. It's a formative assessment. You're, there's no threat. So far we've got how trauma can make learning impossible, how to retrieve info, the growth mindset, how memory functions, and the impact that injuries have on learning. A couple yeah. of attendees are also mentioning motivation and, and what triggers that as well. Excellent. All right. So I'm going to give an answer. And we can start from there and, you know, we, we can debate it long into the evening, right? But I would argue, I, the starting point needs to be about what I would say is the most promising research from neuroscience that should inform teachers. And that's this concept of neuroplasticity. If you don't believe, if teachers and school leaders and parents don't believe students can improve, the brain, they, the, they can change their brains, right? This might not be the right field, profession for us, right? We know, and let's launch the second poll right now for a second, if you don't mind. It's the second question. So what do you guys think? Is the human brain set at an early age, true or false? Set means fixed, sort of unchangeable, right? So I'm going to end the poll quickly. I love the answers, right? 
the answers for that question, 19, 19 of 20 of you said it's, it's false. Well, that's good. You either read the book, but it is false. Our brains are able to learn throughout our lives due to neuroplasticity. And this is good news. Even for a guy like me, I'm 51 years old. Now, I don't know if I take up a uh, guitar today, if I'll ever be, a, you know, can, can be in, in Bruce Springsteen and E Street Band, right, which would be like my dream. I am from New Jersey, so I'm a little, I have a little man crush on Bruce Springsteen. Hopefully some of you else in the audience uh, do as well. But we, are, but we as teachers are brain changers. And I would love you leave tonight with that mindset. The schools that our students go to and the experiences our kids have with us rewires or strengthens the current neural pathways. Actually, I love the title as being a brain changer. Right. And if you here's a, an overstated, right, an overly simplistic representation of the change in synaptic density. So for those of you who are working with the youngest learners in primary or elementary, right, look at the synaptic density early on when, when we get those students. And then I don't know if you guys know the, the, uh, the neuroscience phenomena that takes place between ages in 16, 14. I uh, don't know if you want to throw it in the chat. But what, what's going on between six and 14? It, it is called something. Pruning, we got puberty. Yep. Oh, well, yes, so we got them both, right? So <laughs> certainly no, it's brain, it's brain pruning, right? If you don't use it, you lose it. Uh, Judy Willis talks about this all the time, right? And not only you know, is it pruning away, but when it's staying and you use it more, obviously the myelin, myelin sheathing gets thicker and, and the, the uh, synapse and then things get stronger and things move faster. So again, love pruning. Puberty, though I want to acknowledge, is one of the two most sensitive periods of, of, of brain changing. We know zero to two and puberty are the most sensitive times for changing the brain. So when you have them as your young learners or your middle school learners or maybe early high school years. And I want you to think about this. And I would argue knowing a little bit more about the architecture of the brain, that the emotional center, the amygdala, is in the limbic system where also one of the memory centers are. Um, and that we know when kids get into this high stress, toxic stress, as somebody mentioned, right, that that paralyzes learning and makes it so much harder for kids to work in the high order thinking parts of their brain, the prefrontal cortex. I would argue we should elevate, not in a crazy amount, what teachers know about the architecture of the brain as it relates to uh, teaching and learning and the school experiences and the environments we create for kids every day. And here's why. At minimum, you have three different types of kids in every single one of your classes, right? So I'm currently teaching right now 10th grade history, right? You know, I have a student who's currently struggling and I use the word currently very intentionally. Uh, I have a student, Kennedy, who's currently just fine. And I, you know, Liam's knocking it out of the park so far. My understanding of neuroplasticity is that all these students, through the right amount of support, social and emotional, challenge and scaffolding, proper timing of formative assessment and summative assessment, will allow them all to get better. So I'm going to stop there for a second. Based upon what I just shared about neuroplasticity, is there anything in your practice as an educator? that you might keep doing, you might tweak, you might stop doing, or you might start doing. And I would love you just to pick one of the squares and just put one thing in one of the squares. So again, play long. This is that active moment. And it's also time, if there's anything in the chat, Damien and Siobhan, or, or any questions that are emerging, good time to have a little come up for air. So we're just picking one of the squares. We're doing keep, tweak, start, or stop and then what you would do associated with whatever square you picked. Right, so again, I just, just talked a little bit about neuroplasticity. If you wanna share what you wrote in your, in, your, in your square, that'd be great so we can build our community. That'd be fantastic. Well, you told them to grab paper, so they're probably all writing in on paper first, and they gotta come back to the keyboard. I would like to know how many people are actually using paper. That'd be <laughs> awesome. <laughs> uh, I, I, I asked my students today if they had paper during class, and ooh, that, was, that was a big ask. So I don't know if anybody wants to share, based upon my, my brief introduction to, of neuroplasticity, 
what might they keep do, doing tweak, stop, or start? I, I don't know if anybody popped in. I'm using paper. Tracy, thank, thank you, Kathy. <laughs> Excellent. Greg's going to tweak, trying to allow time for students to mentally enter the classroom space before they start sharing. Eric's going to tweak the structure of the questions asked to cause more thought in creating the answer. Bianca is going to keep using rubrics to allow for students to improve and be rewarded for their final achievements rather than Love faulting it. them for their learning challenges. So some, some great ones so far. Yeah. yeah. No, I think rubrics are great. And, you know, I would argue as we think about this school year, you know, measuring, we're really trying to help teachers, our own especially, think about growth as opposed to gaps, right? We've talked a lot about what learning gaps might have ensued being away from in-person schooling. You know, if we can get, you know, baselines of where kids are maybe in reading levels or, or maths or, or knowledge of, of historical facts that you guys want them to know or understanding of uh, elements of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. You know, start from, get a baseline and work from there to measure growth. And I think rubrics are an excellent, excellent tool for that. All right. Second, I want you to name in the chat, please. I said neuroplasticity is something every teacher, school leader should know. And I know you did this sort of already, but let's say you get another chance to name a second thing. All right. Where, what might you say, hey, Glenn, you know what? This has to be it. This has to be the second thing. I'm fully convinced. So what is the second thing? If I believe neuroplasticity is the first, and here it comes, I will give it to you now. I want to talk a little bit about mindsets. And mindsets is this pathway to think also about motivation. So uh, some of you might know uh, uh, and be familiar with growth mindset. Maybe some of you've read Carol Dweck's book. Carol's a you know, fantastic researcher. There is, you know, there's been some challenges to growth mindset. It's been hard to replicate. Schools sometimes said, okay, if we create growth mindset posters and growth mindset t-shirts, and that means kids have a growth mindset. And that's not what she meant. And she, she reminds us of that, that a growth mindset needs a challenge. And if you remember, this is what a growth mindset is. And not surprisingly, it sort of fits really nice with neuroplasticity, right? It is something though, right? She will say, we can have both a growth and fixed mindset at different points in, in our experiences. You know, it's not like you're 100% growth mindset or 100% fixed mindset, uh, but I think it's really something to think about. I don't know if you're familiar with this organization, but I wanted to share with you. The Mindset Scholars Network is one of, one of the research bodies out there that we lean heavily on. And if it's not on your radar, I would, I would really encourage you to put it on your radar. These are uh, a network of university professors, David Yeager, Chris Holloman, Mary Helen Emerdiner Yang, Carol Dweck. Please check out their site. I, I'm not part of the organization, though I'm friends with them, because when we were introduced to them, they made us aware that there's more than one mindset. And they would argue, or we would argue, that the belonging mindset is actually more important in terms of motivating students, engaging students, at least initially, than growth mindset. If a student doesn't feel like he, she, they, however they identify belong in your school or your community, how are we going to ask them to lean in and grow and get better? So I don't know if, you're, if the belonging mindset's new to you, but it's really become an important element of the work of the center, and more importantly, how we prioritize this mindset um, in our school community. Here's what a belonging mindset is. And my question is, do your students and families feel this way? Now, certainly no, you, if you've watched the news in the United States, we're, we're in a historic period of civil rights and racial redress that started in the spring. But do all your students, regardless of race, class, gender, sexual orientation, right? Students from indigenous populations or first nation populations, do they feel like they belong in your schools? Do they feel validated in every classroom? These are questions that I would argue set off the emotional center of the brain, right? The, the, the emotional traffic cop, the, the amygdala. 
There's a term I want to introduce to you as well called downshifting. We were, we were introduced to this term by Dr. Merrill Hardiman at Johns Hopkins University, wonderful author of the Brain Targeted Teaching Model. Johns Hopkins has a, a fantastic uh, graduate level programs in MBE, so check, their, check them out. But downshifting happens when negative emotions cause us to process in, in our amygdala, in our emotional center, and doesn't allow us to do our higher order thinking. And students are downshifted all the time, whether it's by peers, sometimes not intentionally by teachers. So how do we upshift students, make them feel like they belong in our school communities? So I'm gonna try something, this is a brave moment for me. One way is to get a little social and emotional temperature of your, of your students. I don't know if you're familiar with the blob tree, but I use this every so often to gauge how my students are feeling. So let me, if we do this right, you have the ability to annotate. You know, if you go to annotate and you click on the stamp feature, I would like you to stamp one of the blobs about how you are feeling right now socially and emotionally as an adult. So you click on stamp, you can take a star, you can take an arrow. Excellent, Damien, you're a good, good modeler. And again, how do you take the social and emotional temperature um, of your students? I, I put myself here, I, I think I put myself here. One, because I feel like I'm not tonight right now, I'm in a community of educators. Uh, we're trying to learn together. Uh, we're sharing ideas, sharing experiences. Blob tree, if you, if you, if you uh, Google it, you'll be able to find it. We have certainly permission from the author and I, I think he shares, he shares pretty, li pretty liberally. So add it into your practice or if you have questions about it, certainly holler about it. So again, all these slides will be available, the video's available, but how do you create belonging in your schools, right? Here are some things that we've been thinking about in regard to distance learning, hybrid learning, and ultimately when we get back on campus together. And I think this last one we have, is a new one for us, right? That students are not feeling left behind because of tech challenges, technology inequities, right? Wi-Fi connections differ per each house, right? This, this saps motivation, right? If a student doesn't feel like they belong, what's going to motivate them to want to dive in and engage in the school and the experience? So again, uh, this was the second of three mindsets. And the third mindset I want to introduce to you is the purpose and relevance mindset. And this has a lot of connection with motivation and motivation theory. I'll let you read this for a second because we know reading from slides actually increases cognitive load. And I think all of us have been challenged by student motivation in distance learning or hybrid learning, right? There, there's schools where, you know, half the student population doesn't, is not showing up for classes, right? Or students are there, but they're sort of not there. They're on multi, they're on a different, you know, they're, they're on a different computer while they're at home. And this, I would argue, is a shared authority between teacher and student, right? We have to set up the learning environment, the experiences that, that are gonna pique student interests. And how do you do that is a great challenge in education, especially when we cannot do it in person, where we uh, very often right now, at least in the United States. So here are a couple things I wanna to suggest to you. To, to elevate purpose and relevance and motivation. And we know there's two types of motivation in every school. There's intrinsic motivation and there's extrinsic motivation. There's, there are research studies that I could suggest uh, to look at that merely by writing on every homework assignment or every assignment you give, the purpose of the assignment, you are, you are helping to motivate students because now they understand why they're doing this. So I don't, if we, we post our homework every night on, on a learning management system called Canvas. Every one of my assignments will say the purpose of this assignment is. And I would argue if you can't answer that question, your assignment's probably not good enough. And then you're just asking kids to do school as opposed to engage and get creative and, and enjoy school. Finding out what kids see as relevant in, the, in what they're studying 
to what you're assigning, right? Certainly I teach, I teach history. I give them constrained choice very often. And again, constrained choice allows me to achieve my learning objectives or my learning goals, but students might not all take the same pathway. If you're not familiar with Dr. Mary Helen Emerdino Yang's work from USC, and if you, ASCD is a great organization and produces uh, really rich resources. You know, Dr. Mary Helen Emerdino Yang this summer worked with our faculty, and she, and, excuse me, worked with our, our community of teachers that we brought together. And she said this uh, point, I took immediate notes as you can expect, students forget the stuff that doesn't matter to them. What do you want students to remember 20 years down the road. It's often not the stuff we give them all these assessments on. If we give kids a chance, okay, to pursue passions and, and that they're interested in, that align with our curriculums, we're gonna, we're gonna elevate their motivation. Uh, we just recently wrote an article, Siobhan, I'll put the link in the chat. Project-based learning is a great way to motivate students right? It's sharing authority. It allows them to socialize in ways that we really miss. We're not, we're not being able to be on campus. So we just re recently wrote this, Ian uh, and myself for Edutopia, to think about project-based learning as a way to elevate motivation when you give students choice, more autonomy, chance to collaborate with their peers. But I will say this, there's good project-based learning and there's, I can't say it any better, there's lousy project-based learning. Some project-based learning actually increases, okay, uh, learning gaps. So I want you to keep that in mind. All right. So what would you keep, tweak, stop, or start based upon my sharing of the three mindsets, growth, belonging, and purpose and relevance? Glenn, maybe while they're doing that, and because obviously we have a few fans of paper here, can you give us an example of something you've done with your history class recently when you explain the why for their homework? Maybe something you've assigned in the last week or two? Yeah, I mean, so great example. After I finish this call, I am, I, 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 I'm positive in my email, yeah. I'm going to be inundated, inundated by about three or four emails. So tomorrow, my students have a, their first essay of the year due, hmm. right? Here are my directions that I gave my students in the assignment. This essay is a culminating assessment of our historical methods module because as Secretary Bunt said, historians write. Its purpose is to show what you have learned about how to be a big like historian. Uh, it is meant to be challenging because learning happens when you think hard. You know, that was my making it clear to students and I, every one of my assignments has something like that. Yeah. And, we, and it, to be honest, this is an example where research got me into this new place. I wasn't doing this five years ago, I promise you. Yeah. Yeah. So great. Thanks, Damien, for the uh, setup. A good, uh, good thing I had the document open. That was a great time. Well, we didn't actually see it, but I think we followed along. <laughs> oh. With you. No. oh, no. Oh, <laughs> no. It's okay. No. It's okay. No, no. We got a few uh, good responses while you were sharing the, the why. So we had tweak projects to allow for more voice and choice. I love that. Love uh, that. Start putting the assignment purpose in writing and adding the secondary purpose, right? Uh, yep, keep love that. using stories to set up relevance of lessons. So yes, very aligned with what we were just talking about. Great. Okay. I'm probably getting people nauseous by pretending like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Fantastic. So you guys get it. So think about, don't just don't think about growth mindset in your schools. You get to go back to your colleagues tomorrow, you know, get a cup of coffee, get a cup of tea and introduce them to the mindset of belonging and the mindset of purpose and relevance. And if there's a third thing, and not surprisingly, this is my own setup, and then we're going to open up the questions and have some chat, more chat. We got about 15 minutes left. A uh, hard stop at seven my time because I got to, A, I got to read these papers, and B, I got to be a father. If you're not familiar with Chris Holliman's team at the Motivate Lab at the University of Virginia, please, like the Mindset Scholars Network, get it on your professional radar. Chris has been a great friend and an ally in this work. He recently wrote an article with Ian Keller about keeping kids engaged. And it's, again, practical, transferable stuff, whether you're teaching in Canada, the US, or, or other parts of the world. And I was reading the New York Times this weekend, 
And I saw this quote from, from, from the great Steve Jobs. We know for schools at times kill curiosity and the motivation of our kids, at least the intrinsic motivation. I would argue teachers on this call of our youngest students, primary, the, the motivation, the, 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 the freedom our students have when they're young, it, it, it weans off because of this pressure in the US especially about grades and, and standardized testing and college admission, right? So I wanna just introduce you very in a light way to something called the expectancy value cost theory. And you're gonna see some real connections to purpose and relevance mindset, right? And think about this, and, and I hope we can continue to talk about this at another time, but not surprisingly, of this alignment with purpose and relevance mindset. The expectancy part of it, do students believe they can do the task, right? Do they have the right strategies? Are they getting the right feedback from you, the teacher? And feedback that's not always comes with a grade. Are they having times to reflect and think about themselves as learners? And what you say matters. So let me give you one example. Here are two types of feedback to students. I'm giving you these comments so you'll have feedback on your paper, or I'm giving you these comments because I have very high expectations and know that you can reach them. Which one of these student groups, based upon the feedback, tended to revise and give more effort into another draft of their paper, do you think? And here's the data, right? And what is really important to note is among African-American students in this study by David Yeager and others, all right, of the, of the willingness to revise an essay, basically because he said, I have high expectations and I know you can reach them. How you talk to your students is really critically important in terms of motivation. Don't downshift, upshift. So uh, last two things, and then we can value. Do students wanna do the task? Is there a, a level of autonomy? Is there time to connect with others, relatedness? Is there stories, can they, can they create their own learning journeys and their stories through this? And then the cost. What are the barriers preventing students from doing the task? And as teachers and school leaders, how do we break down those barriers? Some are, you know, along diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging lines. Some are along of just scaffolding the assignments and the chunk size. Because we want to create this shift of how do we move students and motivate students from just doing school, as Denise Pope once wrote, the great Stanford researcher and a good friend of ours, to really enjoying school. To get, how do we get this spirit, even when we're learning from a distance. So again, think about your keep, tweak, stop, and starts. The field is broad. We only covered three pieces of it tonight, mindsets, motivation, neuroplasticity. We made it a little easier for you, though. Maybe Siobhan can throw this in the chat. We created a top 10 back-to-school strategy sheet that please share liberally that sort of condenses a lot of what I said tonight into 10 strategies. Let's open up the questions. We got, looks like we got 10 minutes, and then I have my big finale. Any questions that are percolating in the chat or elsewhere? We'll just give people a second to, to start writing yep. them, but I had one that came in through, through email, Glenn. So any suggestions for kids who are maybe, overwhelmed, unhappy. It's, it's easy to teach to technophile bright kids with curiosity and a love for learning, but that's not most students these days. Do you have a way to reach the shy, the scared with a low frustration threshold? Can I compete with YouTube? I, 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 the last part of that question is sort of a, a tough one. Uh, I know some people might be watching this on YouTube eventually. Here's my, my first gut instinct. There's a couple things that come to mind. You don't need to surrender your teacher's secret powers mm -hmm. to distance learning. And I think sometimes we, we have. And that is the, the building of relationships, 
the one-on-one -on -one moments that really are transformative for our students. Yes, we have a new barrier between us and kids, right? I can't sit next to a student, right? Or get to eye level in some way, maybe I can. But it still comes down to your secret sauce is, is around the social and emotional and relational uh, connection. And the kids who I've not done my best for in the last six months, it's because I failed them there. I didn't prioritize, I, I sometimes prioritize my content and lost sight of the social and emotional relationships. The other thing is you, you, you gotta, you know, especially at the beginning of a new year here, you know, what are their passions? You know, and don't be afraid to empower them to say, look, let them, let them run a little. It might not be perfectly aligned with your curriculum. And I know that creates challenges, but those would be my first things. Use your secret power as a, 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 a your social, emotional, relational work. That'd be my first, first instincts. Yeah, that makes sense. Kelly with a great comment in the chat, you know, it's about relationships. It's about empathy, listen to them and, and be flexible. I used to think as an educator, I taught, they learned. Students leave their identity, right? Their emotions at my door. They don't bring them into history class. When I learned though, I would argue, when I started learning about the limbic system, about the amygdala and the hippocampus and parts of the brain, it really changed myself as, a, as an educator and how I engage with my kids. I have a high bar for everybody, but I also have a high social and emotional connection bar for everybody. So, sorry, I jumped in. No, that was important to hear. Another question, this one's from Angelica. What can educators do when the student has a cultural barrier to accept education from a male or female teacher? Ah, uh, right. Yeah, that, that, that's a, a, a tough one, right? Yeah. To be honest, you know, that's, you know, how do you, for me, my answer is one is I, I, I would be curious what research exists on that. I, I certainly have to believe there's some. How do you develop relational trust is going to be the challenge for that teacher, right? Because you are fighting historic cultural barriers. Right, and we saw that. Right, we in the in what I gave that impacts motivation. What messages are getting at home versus what the school's trying to employ? Again, I, I would come at it as you know the one-on-one -on -one conversations we can have with a student yield so much as, of an opportunity to develop that relational trust. I don't know who the person who was asked that, but I would love an email from you because. I think there's a piece of research that I could probably guide you to, but I just can't do it right off the top of my brain. Right, so well, Angelica, you're going to email Glenn. Oh, Angelica. You yeah. guys will email me, Angelica. I might be able to, I might have something to help you out. Yeah. What kind of connections, Glenn, do you have with teacher education? Any consideration being given to adding this kind of research to the curriculum for teacher certifications? Well, look, I would argue, right. You know, I, I would joke, right. You know, if I had a heart problem and went to my heart surgeon and I, and he said, I never studied the heart, I would probably go find another surgeon. Right. Right. Well, you know, I bring my brain to, to school every day. I would think, I would like to think as a, as a parent that my, the, the teachers have an understanding of the science behind how the brain learns. We know that's not the case. Our, our hope, our wish in the States is that you, you, you know, some level of understanding of the science of learning should be part of your certification. Right. Now, we also want to support the teachers who are already in the field. And that's what the center does a lot. So we've created like uh, both printed resources and the virtual tool that I'll just share with you right at the end here that 10 of you can get as a way to sort of scale up this work in school. So you know, we train whole school districts through a virtual tool. And so it's possible. I am hopeful that when that more pre-service and graduate programs will make sure that educational neuroscience training um, is part of the development of the not only the next generation of educators, but those who currently are in classrooms. Those I never want to, whether you're a five-year teacher or in my case, a 28-year teacher, or there might be some people more, right? we can professionalize the practice together by giving people the most promising research and how the brain learns. I, I can't think of a better segue for you to kind of open up what, what, what current teachers have available within uh, NeuroTeach. Right. Yeah. So let me uh, share this. And again, we want to work with you. We know professional development. There's three things that are needed for great, for effective professional development. 
It needs to be focused on helping real students, like our star people early on. It has to be informed by research, and more importantly, it has to be sustained and iterative. Uh, I, I hope you enjoyed tonight together, but we know the one and done professional learning experience doesn't really create change in practice. So, you know, you all came with some prior knowledge. You now have taken another step, right, with this webinar, um, and, and which I'm so excited to have. We have tools, for example, if you're at a school or district who wants to know your, what, what's your sort of MBEIQ, we have a free neuroeducation confidence diagnostic that we can deliver for you, it takes about eight minutes, as a way to get some data. We've been producing science of learning guides to educational technology, all free. I really would love to steer you to exploring and maybe asking Siobhan for a demo or for the 10 of you guys uh, in the audience who get it, who are gonna win a copy. Um, our book, NeuroTeach, is being read by many educators around the world. But explore NeuroTeach Global. This is a, a virtual professional learning experience. It's synchronous or asynchronous. It's 12 micro courses that uses the science of learning to teach the science of learning. We break it down into four tracks around learning environments, curriculum, pedagogy. You can train your whole school or district in a very fun, storified, innovative way using this tool. Best way to learn more about it, just reach out to us. We will, we'll give you a demo, we'll walk you through it, see if it's a good fit. But we've created uh, publications, in-person programming and virtual tools to bridge this gap that we know teachers have. So thanks Damien for the setup and the ability to share. And my, my close is this, you know, how would you answer this question? Before this webinar, what did you used to think about the learning brain? But now what are you thinking after our time together? This is called an exit ticket. I had every one of my classes with it. So I'm certainly not gonna miss the opportunity to end today, but would love to hear from you guys either by email, Twitter, or, or any other way you would like to connect. Uh, Glenn, this has been fantastic. Can't thank you enough for taking the time for you and Siobhan to kind of share this wonderful information and all these resources. There've been so many fantastic resources, you know, including NeuroTeach, including Center for Transformative Teaching and Learning, but so many more that you've shared as well. So when we do send the recording, we'll include all the links in case you guys didn't grab them out of the chat and everything that you put up today. Um, for everyone who's watching the recording, don't hesitate to email Glenn. He's uh, made himself available. So Glenn, good luck with the essays tonight. Um, <laughs> enjoy your hey, dinner. Any, any, any history teachers out there want to do some extra grading, give me a call. Yeah, no kidding. Obviously, Everybody here was very appreciative of making time. We sent one email and got 600 signups. So I'm, I'm sure that these people are going to be interested in hearing from you again. For everybody who tuned in, have a fantastic afternoon or evening, wherever you are. And we'll talk soon. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Damien. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Glenn.